Lord's Day 20, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this, another Lord's Day that Thou has given us. We thank Thee for this document and for all the confessions that Thou didst see to it should be put together for Thy people. We pray that Thou would cause us to benefit from this teaching, from Thy Word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are now dealing with Lord's Day 20, which is the third section of what? Yeah, what it's called. The Apostles' Creed. Okay. Third section. The first section is what? Remember? Uh, the Father. The Father. Second section is the Son, and we have gotten to... Uh, what, what's good about this uh, Psalter is that it uh, numbers the statements, the the, um, the um, principles, and beginning with number eight, which is, I believe in the Holy Ghost, and I believe in the and holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, one good exercise is to meditate on how all of this is the work of the Holy Spirit. How can we can we do something about that noise? It's, oh. that we can we can hear him. He can hear us. He he needs to hear us, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, first of all, question 53. Kenneth, read that. What dost thou believe concerning the Holy Ghost? Answer. First, that he is true and co-eternal God with the Father and the Son. Secondly, that he is also given me to make me by a true faith, a partaker of Christ and all his benefits, that he may comfort me and abide with me forever. All right. The first thing we want to say is that since this is the third of the three uh, blessed persons of the Holy Trinity, here's the question. Here's a question I like to ask from time to time, and that is this. Does every... Christian, uh, oh no, I like to say it this way. Does it is is everyone who believes in the Trinity a Christian? And the tendency is to say what? The tendency is to say no, because we think of this thing superficially. Every person who believes in the Trinity is a Christian because. To believe in the Trinity is not simply to believe that, that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. To believe in the Trinity is to believe in the Trinity as it relates to salvation. The Father is God and must be because uh, this is so wonderful. This is so amazing. This is so something that you can't get to the end of. The Father is and must be God because only God can tell you what to do. And think about that, Maureen. If that's not true, you couldn't possibly be convicted of sin. Meditate on that, right? If God couldn't tell you what to do, nobody could tell me what to do. If God couldn't tell you what, you couldn't possibly be convicted of sin. How so? You got it? What is conviction of sin? Well, it, what we're dealing with here is, and, and so how, and so what has since it is true to say that only God and God can tell you what to do. What has He told us to do that convicts us of sin? We just mentioned it today, right, Tom? Um, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Uh, ten, <laughs> huh? The ten. In the, in, the, in the Hebrew, I think it says either ten words or ten statements. Right? It doesn't say commandments. Look that up. Anyway, ten words. 
seven last words of the jerk, the ten last words, seven last words. We never did it that way before. Uh, God has told us, only God can tell us what to do. Otherwise, there would be no conviction of sin. Conviction of sin is realizing that, that there is one who supersedes you. There is one who uh, to whom you are responsible and that demands something of you which you in no way, shape, or form are able to perform. By nature, are able to perform. Unable to perform. I mean, that's conviction of sin right there. What's conviction of sin? Right there. I see, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and I realize only by the Holy Spirit. You realize what? You are a, by, a person who by nature, as Calvin said, you are an idol factory. You will worship anything which is yourself. And on and on and on. So the Father is God because only God can tell you what to do. Alright? The Son is God because only God. See, then you have to work. You have to figure out. See, what's the Father? Work of the Father? He's, we're talking about salvation. Our need of salvation is that He told you what to do and you can't do it. You violated it by nature. Secondly, the Son is God because... What? What would you say? Because only God... First of all, the Father is God because only God can tell you what to do. See, and, and that's the thing. Let's get back to the Father's thing again. See how simple and yet profound this is for me to ask those police, how, is there an objective basis for law, right? I mean, that's all they do is enforce something they don't know anything about. If there isn't, let's say there is an objective basis for law, then what, Kenneth? What are we left with? If there isn't. Yeah, if there isn't, what are we left with? Well, your own whims. Yeah, might is right. You got the biggest gun, then you got you got to do what. Then I got to do what you say. Then I'm gonna work at getting a gun bigger than yours. That's what you're left with. Everybody knows that's wrong. So, the son is God because only God can what? Huh? What does think about what is the work of the Son? The Father gives us His law and demands that we keep it. And we were originally able to keep it. And getting back to the sermon, I haven't preached yet, but then I'm looking forward to preaching in Psalm 96.10. Say unto the heathen, the Lord reigneth. There it is right there. See it? You see it? How does He reign? All day. Oh, well, He controls the turning of the... Of the, of the heavenly bodies. and uh, No, what is, what's the main thing? How does he reign? He reigns by his law. Yeah. And he will destroy. He's going to destroy everything. That's what we're talking about today in reading Psalm 136, right? He is going to destroy all those people who are not reconciled to it. Because he rules by it. This you will do. He says to the Christian, Right? How does Christ actually kill his office of prophet? In revealing to us. Calvin, what? Think about, meditate on this. The what? The, these guys were so, understood the scripture so, so clearly. Christ actually kills the office of a prophet. In revealing to us. Yeah. See, see how that relates to the Father? In revealing to us by his word and spirit. It is my will to say you and therefore I convict you of your total depravity. See that? Revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for us. When you're convicted of total depravity, what is God saying to you? What? I will save you. How can you say, oh, you got to know the bad news before you know the good. That's the good news, right? Thus, saith the Lord. <laughs> what else could be good? Hey, it's good news because he says it. 
right? We're so ate up with what? What am I talking about? You see, you see where I'm going with this? We're ate up with, with this concept. Lee Tatsu, we all true, all truism. Are you kidding me? That a person would do anything other than what is good, what's in it for him? So, the Son is God because only God. In order to save us from this total depravity, only God can pay an infinite penalty for sin. Right? And that's what that whole thing was. What? Numbers. I believe in God the Father. That was the first one only. Beginning in number two, that's the longest one, was Christ. The first one tells us the problem. The second one, the second person of the Trinity, is the solution to the problem. And the third is the result. So Christ, only God can pay an infinite penalty. Why is it an infinite penalty for sin? Paul, then. It's an infinite penalty for sin because we've offended an infinitely holy God. Right. And if you think it isn't, that means what? If you think it isn't an infinite penalty for sin, if you have any problem with eternal hell torments, what does that mean? With believing in eternal, that, 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 that there should be eternal hell, hell torments. If you have any problem with that concept, that means what? That your concept of God is, is a finite. Yeah, yeah, right. You don't know who God is. This is what you must do. What, what, the person who's not totally depraved says what? He says, how far? <laughs> right? He says, jump, how far? Not, oh, I'm not, I don't feel, too, Huh? Do you know who said that? There it is right there. There is no fear of God. None before their eyes. Otherwise, when you're talking to these persons about carnal worship, they'd be listening, right? They'd be listening. How could it be possible that God accepts uh, 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 gory pictures of Christ in a narthex? What's that have to do with, the, with this? How do you understand? How do you know who God is? Through, 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 through saying, oh, I guess it was very painful. What? Worship God in spirit. Only God can pay an infinite penalty for sin. Now we're on the third person of the Trinity. See, see what it means to believe in the Trinity? See how stupid it is to say, oh, yeah, there are people who believe in the Trinity, but they're not Christian. No, they don't. They don't have the slightest God. The Father is God. The Son is God. You think it's your memorizing your multiplication tables. And you don't even you can't even do that without having a better understanding than these people have of the Trinity, right? They can do here's what they can do. If you can do the multiplication table, they can do this. Not only do they know two times six is twelve, they can do this. Two and two, six twos, and right, two, four, six, eight. <laughs> they can figure that out. These cash guys can't even figure out the Trinity this much. The Holy Spirit is God because only God can what would you say? What is the spirit think? What is it? It's all up. What is the spirit's work? What does the spirit do? The Father determines salvation. The need for it being well, God tells us what to do, and the need for it is we can't do any of what He demands of us. The Son comes and procures the salvation by paying an infinite penalty. But when we're born into this world, what is our state? What's our condition? Reynolds. Are we saved since the Son has procured our salvation? We're talking about the elect now, not everybody. Huh? What's our condition, Reynolds? Oh, see, as we're born into the world, the elect, God's elect. Yeah, total depravity. So though Christ has procured our salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and does what? I'll give you a hint. Uh, Ephesians 2. You hath he quickened who were dead in transgressions, and he quickens you. He, the Holy Spirit is God because only God can raise a dead man to life. And that's what he does. That's regeneration. And to monkey with total depravity says, I don't need the Holy Spirit. No, I can do it. My, I, I can 
Sanct yeah, yes, regeneration is monogistic, but sanctification takes a lot of hard work. I mean, come on. Take hard work? No, it's omnipotent work. How much of that can you do? <laughs> so, I mean, this is the, 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 just to meditate on, those, on, on, on that right there. But we're going to go through this quickly. What does the spirit, the term spirit, this is pretty interesting. Did y'all read over this? What does the term spirit signify? What's, the, what's another word for spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit in, in the original? And not only does it mean spirit, it means, remember? Wind. Wind and that's what he's going to get at, too. This is really interesting. The term spirit is sometimes taken for the cause and sometimes for the effect. When taken for the cause, it means the being or force that puts anything in motion. That's the spirit. And is either uncreated or created. Now, I was confused when I read until you read farther on. What does he mean by that? What is uncreated? The spirit that is the Holy Spirit. All right? There are other spirits, such as the angels. Right? Do they have a physical body? No. They're spirits. They're created. They're either uncreated or created. It is uncreated in the sense in which God is essentially and personally a spirit that is incorporeal, incorporeal, indivisible, having the spiritual essence, but so bodily, but no bodily dimensions. God is spirit, shouldn't be a. Spirit as created is either immaterial as the angels, both good and bad, human souls. Uh, wait a second. Who make it as angel spirits? What, what, do you, what did I get this good and bad? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the spirit has created is is either immaterial, and, oh, as the angels, both the good angels and the bad angels. Okay, human souls, um, who maketh his angel spirits. All right, and then it says in, on the next line, or is or it is material as the wind. There it is again, as the wind vapors, etc. The wind bloweth where it lists. That's the same word in the Greek as the word for spirit. John three three. The wind. That's the same word. The wind. Bloweth where it listeth, but you hear that you thou hear the sound thereof, but know not from whence it cometh or whether whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the wind. Same word, but it means spirit. The third person of the Godhead is called a spirit in the next paragraph. Because number one, he is a spiritual essence, immaterial, immaterial, and invisible. Number two, because he is inspired of the Father and Son, and is a person, person through whom the Father and Son immediately influences the hearts of the elect which tells us what his, what his work is. Or because he is the immediate agent, immediate agent of divine works. Meaning what? See, th 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 these terms, we're so dumb that we would, we would have known this 200 years ago when we were 8 years old. But immediate, meaning the, the, the spirit works, can work, all right? Immediately, without any mediation. What did I just number? What was that number? Number what? Uh, num number two. Uh, Im immediately influences the hearts of the elect, or because he is the immediate agent of divine works. Number three, because he himself inspires and immediately influences the hearts of the people of God, in view of which he is called the power of the highest. Number four, because he is God equal and the same with the Father and Son, and he and God is a spirit. He is called holy, and one because he is holy in himself and in his own nature. Holy meaning what? Calvin. See, you've got to know what that word means, otherwise that sentence means nothing. What? Set apart. Right, set apart. Other than. He is other than you and in his own nature. Number two, because he is a sanctifier who immediately sanctifies and makes holy the people of God. The Father and the Son sanctify through the Holy Ghost. That's what he's getting at, see. The Father, do the Father and Son immediately sanctify? No, immediately. That's what he's getting at. Sanctify through the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't sanctify through the Father and the Son. He immediately, he does it himself. Sanctification up through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. Sanctification is of the Spirit. That's what he's getting at. Number two. Who and what is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is the third person of the true and whole, only Godhead, proceeding from the Father and the Son, being co-eternal, co-equal, and co-substantial with the Father and Son. Otherwise, what? He wouldn't be God. And is sent by both into the hearts of the faithful that he may sanctify and fit them for eternal life. Down at the bottom, number one, that the Holy Ghost is a 
Uh, okay, this is this is number two, the big two on page 270. We're going through this quickly because we, we're not going to finish unless we do. Holy Ghost is subsistence or, 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 or person is proven. Number one, from instances which are... Now he's showing how the Holy Ghost is a person. From instances which are recorded, and this is phenomenal, this is the insight of this guy, which are recorded of his having appeared in a visible form. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. See, so he's, he's calling him the Holy Spirit. That's what he's referring to. Number two, that the Holy, why is he a person? The Holy Ghost is a person is evident from the fact that he is called God. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. See, what he's getting at is some people say that the Holy Spirit, that's just a, that's just a modal, modalism. What is modalism? Remember, Kenneth? Mm. Modalism is what? Uh, it's essentially one person uh, Sometimes he himself in, in three different ways. Or yeah. mode or, yeah. he's, that's what he's getting at. He, he, he's a person because sometimes he himself is called God. Not a spirit of God only. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. How could he dwell in you if he's not a person? Number three, the Holy Ghost is a person because he's the author of our baptism and for the reason that we are baptized in him. In the name of the Father, see it? And of the Son and of the Spirit. Three separate persons. Number four, the Holy Ghost is a subsistent may again be inferred from this that the properties of a person are continually attributed to him. Number five, down, further down the page. The Holy Ghost is also clearly distinguished from the gifts of God, which is another proof of his personality. There are diversities, see this? There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. The Spirit gives them. They are his gifts as a person who gives them to us. Number two at the bottom. The Holy Ghost is distinct from the Father and the Son. It's proven against the Sabellians who affirm, so this is, okay, see, this is the big two on page 271, and under the big two are two, <laughs> how many big, how many big numbers, three, three big numbers, I mean, yeah, three, three big numbers under the big two, otherwise you get lost, man, with these guys, Okay, the, one, the, the first number under the big two, which is who and what is the Holy Ghost, is that the Holy Ghost is a, is a person. Number two under the big number, which is who is the Holy Ghost, is that the Holy Ghost is not only a person, he's distinct from the Father and the Son. So he's a, he's a person, but he's not the same person. It isn't modalism. He isn't the same person as the Father. Number one, from the fact that he's called the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Number two, the Holy Ghost is expressly declared in the Scriptures to be distinct. Expressly declared in the Scriptures to be distinct from the Father and the Son. I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter. Who was the first Comforter? God. Christ. See, I'm the Comforter. But see, He said, "I know you're sad, and I'm going to go away because I am your Comfort. But I'm going to send you another." In that word, another. Remember, I said I think it was last week. There are two different words for another in Greek. One means another of the, of the same kind. One means another of a different kind. He's of the same kind. Another comforter. Number three. He said to be sent by the Father and the Son and must therefore be another person. For no one is sent of himself. Oh, hey, I, I think I'm going to... You don't say I'm going to drive over there. I'm going to send myself over in tomorrow. <laughs> you think you guys with the white coats need to come and get you. right? I'm going to send myself over tomorrow and, and meet you. No one sends himself. Number four, distinct attributes are ascribed to the Holy Ghost. All right? And then the, third, the, the three of the big two. The big two is who is the Holy Ghost? Number one, he said he's a person. Number two, he said he's what? Got to be following this. Number two, he said he's what? Not only is a person. This is number two at the bottom of 272. He's, dis he's a distinct person from the Father and the Son. Number three, who is the Holy Ghost? He is equal with the Father and the Son. And the following arguments do most conclusively prove there is communicated to him the essence of the Father and the Son because he proceeded from both and is the spirit of both. Wow, the insight these guys have. 
And this keeps us, all this stuff keeps us from heresy. Think about that. It only takes, you, you know, you, you, you build in a building, all it takes is a little bit, right? If it's off this, this much at the bottom, it's going to fall down when you get up there. There is communicated to him the essence of the Father and Son because he is perceived from both and is the spirit of both. And then the number two under the, of the three of the big two. <laughs> that the Holy Ghost, so what are we talking about here? The two of what? He's, why is he equal with the Father and the Son? They're communicated to him the essence of the Father and the Son. Number two, why is he equal to the Father and the Son? That the Holy Ghost is equal to the Father and the Son. Proven from the fact that all the attributes of the divine essence are attributed to him. Thus, eternity is described. Who could be eternal but God? So he's equal to the Father and the Son, even though he's separate from them. He's proved that he's separate from it. Now he's proven that he's equal to them. We didn't come up with the... Oh, the, the Bible does, he never uses the word Trinity. Huh? It doesn't have to. Number three, the same divine works. Why is he uh, equal with the Father and the Son? Number three, the same divine works which are attributed to the Father and the Son are also the divine works. He said attributes in number two, right? Now this, the same works are attributed to the Father and the Son are also ascribed to the Holy Ghost, such as creation. What, we, what did we say? Whatever God does, He does in three persons. He created. The Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The preservation and government of the whole world. By His Spirit, He garnished the heavens. Next page, 276, number four. The, the Scriptures ascribe the name. Why is He equal? The Scriptures ascribe the name and equal honor to the Holy Ghost, which they do to the Father and Son. But divine honor and worship can be attributed to no one but to God alone. Hence, the Holy Ghost must be equal with the other persons of the Godhead. And then we get the three. And this is the big three, which is uh, 270. What is his office? What is the office of the Holy Ghost? The office of the Holy Ghost is to produce. What does office mean, Tom? What is his office? The standing is what, like his place. Kind yeah, of. What does he do? What's his, uh, what's another word for office, Kenneth, to help us understand? Uh, charge. Yeah, yeah, charge or his. Uh, he, 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 what? He executes office of the prophet, priest, and Right, an office is a responsibility, a, I'm trying to think of a better word, but I can't come up with it. But, uh, what, 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 what he's responsible to do, right? What is his office? Office of the Holy Ghost is to produce sanctification in the people of God. There it is again. He's, he's sanctification of the Spirit. This he performs immediately from the Father and the Son. It is for this reason that he is called the Spirit of Holiness. The office of the Holy Ghost may be said to embrace the following things. To instruct, to regenerate, to unite to Christ and God, to rule, to comfort and strengthen us. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. If we're instructed, what do we what do we what do we know has happened? Harmon, if we're instructed, what do we know has happened? What are you talking about? Huh? Paul then, you know what I'm saying? If we are instructed, which means if we learn, what do we know has happened? Holy Spirit has taught us. Otherwise, you can't learn. Read the Bible all day long, all week long, all year long. For the rest of your life, you will learn nothing apart from... That's why... What do we do when we... Re I hope you do that. Whenever you read the Bible, what do you do first? You pray. Why? Because that was what your mother taught you to do? Because <laughs> what? You're admitting what? You're admitting... <laughs> I know nothing apart from this, and I know nothing apart from the illumination of the Spirit who causes me to understand this. That's the best book. We were talking about that. That's called the book. The word Bible is book. That's the only book. That's a book. This is a book only insofar as it relates to this. <laughs> Otherwise, throw it in the trash can. All right? And so, but as good as it's, as good, as perfect as this book is, it's nothing without the illumination of the Holy Spirit. What, in fact, what does the Holy Spirit do to those who are not illuminated when they read this book? What? Think about... Right? He hardens them through it. 
Behold, thou art a God. That, that's Isaiah 50. Isaiah. Uh, Behold, thou art a God that hidest thyself. That's one of the most uh, riveting verses in all of Scripture. Where are we? Number two, the Holy Spirit regenerates us. What's his office? When he creates in our hearts new feelings, desires, and inclination, or if effects in us faith and repentance. What does that mean? Effects. What is the difference between effect and affect? Is, do you think that's important? <laughs> you think these guys know it, Calvin? Do you know? E-F-F-E-C-T and A-F-F-E-C-T. Same pronunciation. That's called a... What's that called, Gil? You remember? Two words, same pronunciation, different spelling. <laughs> He's got to try to cheat. <laughs> what is it? You guys remember? Huh? Homophone. Same pronunciation. Homo means same. <laughs> same pronunciation, different spelling. But how did I get into this? Oh, it, it, wow, I forgot it that fast. When you get to be 62 years old, it'll happen. <laughs> And go to the garage. What am I out here for? <laughs> was I born in the garage? Is my bed in the garage? I can't even remember why I came out here. A F F E C T and E F F E C T. What is it? Armin, tell us. E F F E C T. He used it as a verb here, didn't he? Wait a second. Yeah. You, it can be a noun, but when it's a verb, which it is, and it isn't used as a verb in here, effects in us. When it's a verb, it means what? To cause, to give rise to... To cause them, to bring something about that wasn't true before. He affected the... <laughs> the turning over of his engine by changing the <laughs> by changing the starter switch ignition switch okay if a, a f f e c t means what Reynolds I mean these two words that they're so important both of them are important and the distinction between the two is perhaps even more because if you don't know then you don't know either one of them they're similar. A F F E C T Reynolds, what is it? Okay, give me a give me a synonym of A F F E C T. See how little time we have in we got it. Cover somewhere. I mean this is it. This is good stuff, right? Give me a synonym of A F F E C T. Wouldn't it be nice if we could speak our own language? Oh <laughs> how stupid are we? Huh? A synonym, somebody come up with it. How about influence, right? To affect. To affect the game. So the guy was, the, 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 the coach was, a, a, a football coach was standing on the side and, and, he, and, and, somebody, and a player ran into him because he was out on the field. He didn't know he was, but he was, and the player ran into him. He affected, see? So it was a penalty. He influenced what was happening on the field. But this is, effect is to bring about something. He affects in us faith and repentance. Meaning what? Before that happened, you didn't have faith, and you didn't have repentance. And the only reason you have it now, as opposed to you not having it before, is what? Because of something he did apart from you. Number three, he unites us to Christ. Meaning what? That sounds cho xiang, as they say in Chinese. That means abstract. It's not abstract. He unites us to Christ. All day. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Union with Christ. It's simple. It's not complicated. 
What does the Holy Spirit do? He unites us with the righteousness of Christ, right? Christ's righteousness is imputed to us through faith. through faith. Where does faith come from? You just said it, right? He affects faith in us, which faith unites us to the righteousness of Christ. Number four. He rules us. To be ruled by the Holy Spirit is to be guided and directed by Him in all our actions. So, once again, he, we're ruled, God rules us by His law, but what's that the relationship of that to the Spirit? See, are we contradicting ourselves? God rules, see, God immediately rules us. Got it? The Father immediately rules us, but the Holy Spirit immediately rules us because to be ruled by us, to be guided, and who guides us and directs us in all our actions? The Spirit causes us to be reconciled to His law. Number five, the Holy Ghost comforts us in our dangers and afflictions. Why is that important, Tom? Oh, I think I can do without that. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> How long would you last? Huh? Why is that important? Um, what does he mean by dangers and afflictions? Temptations. Yeah, they're, 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 the, the real dangers are the spiritual ones, right? Mm -hmm. The danger that we will apostatize. Are you, what does apostatize mean? Apostasy is... Not too sure. Not. Departure from the truth. Okay, I believe the truth. I believe the gospel right now. Why? Did we just learn it? He effects faith in me. Will I believe the gospel tomorrow? Maureen, yes or no? Yes. Well, I hope so. Why? Because once he changes you, it, that's it. It's done. Yeah, I will. The, the, danger, the danger to be protected from is apostasy. Why are you going to believe the gospel tomorrow? Because he's going to see to it that you don't stop believing. Otherwise, what? You would admit, just like that, I'm gone. Such is uh, our resolve. The resolve here, here's another good metaphor. Your resolve is like the morning dew. What do I mean by that? Resolve, you know, resolve that you're determined to do something, you have a lot of resolve. Your greatest resolve is like the morning dew, which, what does it do? <laughs> huh? It disappears with the heat of the sun, right? When the heat of affliction comes without the Holy Ghost, what, Kenneth, what? Where would your resolve go? <clears throat> it would wither and die. <laughs> exactly, just like the morning dew. That's what your resolve is. Comforts us in our dangers and affliction. Danger of apostasy. Affliction causing us to think what? Affliction. That what? What's he talking about here? What, what, what would be an affliction? Illness or... Uh, All right. Or but how about a spiritual thing? Right. It, it, it would be uh, uh, a persecution. Right? Affliction. You're persecuted, and what do you want to think? I don't like people not liking me. Well, who does? <laughs> right? But, but what's more important than people liking you? And, it, and that isn't important, right? Only if you're thinking fleshly, carnally. What is important? What does God think of you, right? Affliction, but blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness. And you will be. Why? Paul, why, are you per why is every true Christian persecuted for righteousness' sake? Because what? Because the common line is enmity against God. Yeah, because our message, think about this. I've said it over and over again. Our message, when we pr proclaim the gospel, what are we aiming at? The very, with our, get to pick up the gun, and you're aiming at the thing that the carnal mind, the unbeliever, loves the most. You want to drive it, you want to just... Right at the middle of it. 
You tell me he's not going to hate you. And what does he love the most? It's Luke 16, 15. Have you memorized that? Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. What is highly esteemed among men? He tells you in the first half of the verse. What is it? What is high? For that which is, I used to, I read that, I read this thing a thousand times without understanding what it's saying. Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men, what's highly esteemed among men? He already told you. What? Their hearts. You, yeah, you're, you, just self justification. You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men, which is self righteousness. Self justification. He, he esteems that. He will leave riches. He will leave honor. He will leave uh, the, the opinion of men. But he will not leave self-righteousness. No. Never leave it. That's the last, as the Puritans used to say, that's the last citadel to go. self right He's not going to get off of that. No, I'm basically a good person. Don't. I, I don't want to hear that. I know I'm a good person. Why? Because I told me so. <laughs> I, I've, told me, I've told me that ever since I was born. Okay. No, what number are we on? Six. Number six. The Holy Ghost strengthens and establishes us. Don't you love the Holy Spirit? I mean, wow. The Holy Ghost strengthens and establishes us when weak and wavering in our faith and assures us of our salvation. Or what is the same thing? He continues and pr preserves us in us. The benefits. There it is. Uh, Impetration. There you see that? Preserves in us the benefits of Christ, the benefits which Christ has purchased for us, even unto the end. Number four on the next page. This is the big four, right? The big four? Which was, yeah, what and how manifold are the gifts of the Spirit? The gifts of the Spirit, what are the gifts of the Spirit? May be referred to and comprehended under the different parts of His office already specified. They include the illumination of the mind, the gift of tongues, prophecy, interpretation, miracles, faith, regeneration, which are enumerated in the New Testament. But we are cessationists, meaning that what? We believe that some of these gifts are gone. Namely, What? Tongues. Gift of tongues. How do you know that? There ain't nobody speaking them. The people who claim to speak them are ignoramuses. They know. They know. You talk to a person who thinks that he speaks in tongues and he knows nothing about this every single time. And he's the same person that says, "Jesus told me some <laughs> Jesus told me to cook ten potatoes instead of eight. Yeah. Oh wow. I wish I had a I had a relationship with Jesus like that. Well, you can just throw that away and Father, I adore thee. Totally, totally, right? Self centered religion. You what? <laughs> you what? <laughs> okay. God hates, hey, how about this? God hates your adoration. How dare you? <laughs> All right. Okay, the gifts of tongues, the gift of healing, same thing, right? What, what, were the, what was the purpose of these gifts? And then you'll know why they're not around anymore. To authenticate, right? The message. Hey, ain't no more books going to be added. Number five. By whom and next page 280. By whom and why the Holy Ghost was given. The Father gives the Holy Ghost through the Son as the following declarations of the Word of God sufficiently affirm. Wait for the promise of the Father. I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. God has prophesied. He will do that. Why was He given and by whom? He was given by the Father. I will pray the Father and he shall send you another comforter. The Son also gives the Holy Ghost, but in this order that he sends him from the Father, from whom, this is really interesting too, right? There's the Son, so he's saying that the Son, yes, the Son sends the Holy Spirit, but he sends him from the Father, from whom he himself is, from whom he, he himself, so the Father sends the Son too, from whom he himself is and works, in accordance with which it is said, whom I will send unto you from the Father. 
Number six, to whom and what extent and to what extent the Holy Ghost is given. The Holy Ghost is given to be is is said to be given to those who receive his gifts and acknowledge him. He is therefore given differently according to his various gifts. All those who are members of the church, whether they be true Christians or hypocrites, partake of this is interesting too. They call this the normal the um was the normal operation the, the the general I think operations of the spirit huh common area I was looking for that term common operations of the spirit even people in the church remember hey Judas isn't that the most uh, notable uh, uh, example Maureen Judas had what from all from all from all uh, what from all appearances Judas what actually performed miracles common operations of the spirit protected gifts, but yet in a different manner. For the godly do not only receive those gifts which are common, but also those which are special and pertain to salvation. They have not merely a knowledge of the doctrine of God's word, but have been regenerated. And he's talking about a cursory knowledge. Understand? See, that's important too. They have what kind of a, a cur, the, the reprobate? A cursory meaning what? Cursory means uh, just what's a, a, su superficial. Superficial. Wait. So on the surface, this guy that was this guy won't say his name. Um, reminds me of Richard Bacon. Don't ever ask a guy from Texas. If, uh, don't ask ever ask a guy if he's from Texas because if he is, he'll tell you sooner or later. If he isn't, you don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> That's really funny. If he is, he'll tell you sooner or later. If he is, you don't want to embarrass him. Don't even ask him. <laughs> He's that guy. So funny. Okay. So, uh, pertain to salvation. And they have not merely a knowledge of the doctrine of God, but <clears throat> not a... Oh, yeah. What the story I was going to tell is this guy. This guy said, I want you to... Next week, I, wa I want you to uh, read... To give a cursory reading of... What? Cursory? No. You know, that doesn't mean that. He, he thought it meant something else. Cursory means a superficial... Uh, knowledge of the doctrine of God's word, but have regen but have been regenerated and possess true faith, because the Holy Ghost resides. Uh, besides kindling in them a knowledge of the will and truth of God, also regenerates them and imparts unto them true faith and conversion. Okay, number seven. When and how is the Holy Ghost given and received? The Holy Ghost is given as we have already shown when He communicates His gifts. These are the spiritual gifts of faith, etc. And this is done either visibly, which in the case which is the case when he imparts his gifts in connection with certain outward signs, or invisibly when these are communicated without these signs. This is interesting too. Look at this, page 282 at the top. He, is not all, he has not always been given visibly, but only at particular times and for certain causes, like speaking in tongues, right? That's a visible thing. Huh? Healing, visible thing. That and that more largely under the New Testament than formerly under the Old. According to the prophecy of Joel in the last days, I will pour out my Spirit. That's what he's talking about, a visible manifestation of the Spirit. Look at the middle of the page. The ordinary way in which the Holy Ghost is given is through the ministry of the ordinary way. Why does he say that? Harmon. If that's the ordinary way, then what? All day, what's he getting at? Being given the Holy Spirit, being given visibly, is the extraordinary way. Well, 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 okay. Well, you didn't understand what, what I was asking was that that uh, the, the, what the way that we can expect for the Holy Ghost to be given is through the preaching of the Word. But not always. For instance, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And we have every reason to believe that he wasn't the only person. Wasn't there somebody else? Okay, Jeremiah. Yeah. But we have every reason to believe that there are such things as, as the Westminster Confession, elect infants who die in infancy. 
That's the ordinary way. He's given through the ministry of the word and the use of the sacraments. And that, in the first place, by manifesting himself to us through the study of the doctrine of the gospel, so as to be known by us. It was in this way that he wrought in the hearts of those who were converted under the preaching of Peter in the day of Pentecost, and also upon Cornelius and those who were present with him when Peter addressed them. We must not, however, suppose that the Holy Ghost operates in such a manner through the word and sacraments as to be so tied or bound to them as to make it impossible for him to work in any other form. For he does not convert all who hear the gospel, and others, again, are converted in a different way. We were just talking to this Paul, as Paul his way to Damascus. I don't, I, I, for some reason, <clears throat> I don't think that, I disagree with that. Or maybe I just misunderstand him. Uh, when I think of Paul on the way to Damascus, I don't think of that in the same way as I think of, of elect infants dying in infancy. You see what I'm saying? I think when Paul was on the road to Damascus, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that the Holy Spirit somehow brought to remembrance, understand? That he, this guy, this guy probably memorized. I mean, the guy, think how brilliant the Apostle Paul was. He probably had the whole of the, that was the whole Bible at the time, memorized. So I think the Holy Spirit brought to his remembrance uh, on the road to Damascus. And John the Baptist was sanctified or furnished with the gifts of the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Hence, when we say that the Holy Ghost is given through the ministry of the Word, and the use of the sacraments. We mean of adult. We speak of adults and of the ordinary way in which he is given and of the visible sending of the Spirit, which it is said God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. Okay, page 283, number 8. How may the Holy Ghost be retained, which is interesting. He's basically, are you going to take that for granted? The Holy Ghost may be retained very much in the same way and by the use of the same means through which he is given and received, among which we may mention the following. Number one, what is it? Get in. A diligent attention to the preached word. Okay. What's the opposite of that? So we can know what he's talking about. Ecclesiastes 5.1. Look at it. Hold on. You, that's one of our verses, right? No, sir. Ecclesiastes 5.11, is that what it is? What is it? Fly what? Keep thy foot. Go, Calvin. Keep thy foot. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. A diligent attention to the preached word. Sit there and be fumbling around and fooling around and daydreaming. No! That's what keeps you. And if he, if think about this, this ought to put some fear in you. Hey, guess what? Guess what the devil uses to, to send people to hell? People that go, that go to worship and daydream. Yeah, a diligent attention to the preached word. Number two, serious meditation upon the doctrine of the gospel and an earnest desire. I remember when I was first regenerated. Man, I looked through the Bible and I got I got an old Bible and I I wrote down every time I saw the gospel where it was. Serious meditation upon the God, doctrine of the gospel and an earnest desire of advancing in the knowledge thereof. I forgot to mention something today in the message. I was going to say uh, that... Uh, what was that last point I said that we... Uh, yeah, I don't trust... We don't trust our concept of goodness. And we don't trust our understanding of the scripture. See what I'm saying? You read... Why do you read Kelvin? Why do you read Augustine? Why do you read Turretin? Why do we read? Why do we read Luther? Why? Because they have tremendous insight. Yeah, and this is the history of the church. You think the history of the church was a farce? The history of the church is what, what was produced by God. These are the men signally used of God. So you, when you read the Scripture, God don't make you a Baptist. <laughs> That's what they came up with. <laughs> what do I mean? What do I, what do I mean, Maureen? A Baptist thinks what? He thinks individualistically. What does he think? He thinks he chose. Yeah, and he thinks he can come up with it on his own. No, we don't think like that. We don't trust our reading of the Scripture. Of course, we know that the Holy Spirit... See, I'm not contradicting myself. I'm not saying we don't believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. No, I'm saying 
Apart from that, we want to know if we if you really want to understand, you read the works of the men that God has most signally used. And when you do, what do you find out? When you read Luther, what do you find out? Oh, it blows your mind, right? It blows you away. It makes you say, wow. Like he's kind of said, I could have written that myself. Well, you could have if you'd been smart enough. <laughs> what he was saying was, what he was saying was, hey, he's saying the same thing I'm saying. He's saying it more eloquently, right? He's saying the exact same thing that the Holy Spirit teaches up me when I read this. And it encourages you to, that's a blessed cycle, right? To learn more and then read more and then learn more and then pray for the Holy Spirit. Number three, constant penitence and an earnest desire of avoiding those sins which offend the conscience. How do we retain what? I think what I said was, <laughs> it's as though I had written it. Right. I, I don't hold that arrogant notion. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> <laughs> constant penitence how is the Holy Spirit retained constant penitence and an earnest desire of avoiding those sins which we pray every night when we go to bed that God will forgive us from our unbelief and sins which offend the conscience number four constant and earnest prayer how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him ask him for enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Number five, the Holy Ghost may be retained by proper use of the gifts of God by devoting them to the glory of God and the salvation right now. What do you think he gave you those gifts for? Right? What, what are we getting at? What did he give you the gifts for? To edify the church. Yeah. And, and, and to use them. Hello. <laughs> to use, and in the use of them. Is it any surprise that he gives you assurance, right, that, that these are the gifts that he gave me? Number nine, big nine, whether and how the Holy Ghost may be lost. This is really interesting. Now, first and foremost, Mari, when you read that, what do you think? I hope you think. Whether and how the Holy Ghost may be lost. What do you think immediately? In an absolute sense, all right. As far as well, let's see what he where he's going with this. Hypocrites and reprobate sinners lose the gifts of the Holy Ghost totally and finally. By which we mean that. The, so, what does he have to mean? Lose the gifts of the Holy Ghost. What kind of gifts is he talking about? The common operations of the Spirit in the church. The reprobate outside of the church, what do, they have? what do they have? Nothing. The common operations. I wish you mean the Spirit at length leaves them so completely that they never recover his gifts or enjoy any of his precious influences. It is different, however, with those, as Maureen was just saying, as those who have been truly regenerated. Meaning what? That isn't lost. Number 10 at the bottom. Why the Holy Ghost is necessary. Look at page 285 at the top. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Not that we are, not that we are 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency is of God. What's he saying there all day? Don't forget this is under the category of why the Holy Ghost is, necess is necessary. Holy Ghost is necessary because only with the Holy Ghost are we sufficient to stand before God's judgment. Right. And He is our complete sufficiency of, for understanding. He is sufficient for our understanding. He and He alone gives us understanding. The fact that we uh, make our calling and elections sure and study to show ourselves approved unto God is doesn't produce the work of the Holy Spirit but is a result of the Holy Spirit that you study to show yourself approved unto God he is our sufficiency if any man have not the spirit of Christ he is none of his hence we may thus conclude he is necessary for our salvation and the last one eleven how we may know that the Holy Ghost dwells in us you think that's important oh, I think I'll <laughs> you think you better than we may know if the Spirit of God dwells in us by His 
A F F E C T S or E F F E C T S, Calvin? Huh? Right, by his effects. Meaning what? Right, what he has brought about in us. And what's he talking about? First and foremost, what does he say? A correct, not, see, see how, what, what an encouragement that is. That you can, that you do understand the antithesis. And these guys that never talk about it, what? Kenneth, these guys that never talk about it, what? What is that? I mean, if you never talk about anything, what does that say? As far as you're concerned. You don't know. It's not important to you, right? We talk about it constantly because what? What we're just talking about? A correct knowledge of God. It isn't this, but it is this. The concept of deceit, guile. Huh? He wants you to think it's such, such and such and such and such, but it isn't that. It is this. A correct knowledge of God. And, and, and understanding, knowing that you have a correct knowledge of God is what? That's part of your insur assurance. That's a big part of it. That I can distinguish. And you look at these people and, they, and, and their eyes glaze over and you say, yeah, he, he's, he, he's clueless. A correct knowledge of God. Regeneration. Meaning what? A correct knowledge of regeneration means what? As opposed to an incorrect... What would be an incorrect knowledge of regeneration? Tom. Tom. Common grace may be. Okay. What is the main incorrect knowledge? Misunderstanding of regeneration. That what? That faith precedes Exactly. Regeneration. Correct understanding of pre regeneration. You're, did... Did, okay, Lazarus, if you're serious about coming out of that grave, just let it be known by the up, let, uplifted hand. And if he lifted his hand up, Maureen, what would that prove? That he had it. <laughs> he was already alive. Huh? Like, once again, they, hey, they don't understand that because, not because it's rocket science or rocket surgery. <laughs> Bacon says this is a rocket surgery. It's not because it's rocket science. It's because... It's, they don't understand. It's, 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 it's foreign to them. Regeneration produces faith. A, 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 a correct knowledge of God, regeneration, faith. What about, what would, what would be an incorrect knowledge of faith apart from the relationship to regeneration? What would we say? Think about this. This is good for us. Paul, then, what would you say? An incorrect knowledge of faith would be what? An incorrect knowledge of faith would be believing that faith its origin in you and not and it is a gift of Holy Ghost. Alright. A faith. Uh, what else? Kenneth, can you think of anything off the top? I'm, I'm trying to think of oh. something that's on the tip of my tongue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Faith meaning what? That faith, that your faith is the meritorious cause. Good. Right. Incorrect. That your faith, yes. What do we say? The difference between the difference between the, the similarity between the false gospel and the true gospel respecting faith is that both the false gospelites and the true gospelites believe in the necessity of... That's the similarity. What's the difference? The difference is the false gospelite believes that faith... They're not going to use those words because they don't read. They don't think. But what they really believe is that faith is the, is the meritorious cause of justice. They are saved because they believe. Because they did something, it doesn't matter what it is. Because they believe. God accepts them. That's the false. The peace of conscience and the beginning of new obedience to God. Okay, any questions? Oh, this was fabulous. I don't know about you, but I really, I really like this one. I mean, the Holy Ghost is... Uh, Hey, why did we understand what we were just understanding? Because <laughs> of, of what we're studying, because of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day that Thou hast given us. We thank Thee for this Heidelberg. We thank Thee that Thou hast taught us by Thy Spirit. And we pray for further enlightening, enlightenment of the Spirit that we might know so that we might do that we might know and that we might do. And we pray for protection and help 
as we were just reading about, in affliction, that thou wouldst increase our faith through thy spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.